Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Silverman, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health and ACA Sports Council Chiropractor the Year 2015. I'm going to share with you some insights on the gut's effect on brain health and immunity. Let's just start it off with a little background information. Your microbiome, the teeming community of trillions of bacteria in your colon, play a central role in both a healthy digestive system and a healthy brain. The two, without question, are connected through your body's complex immune system. When the gut microbiome is out of balance, the immune impacts can affect not just digestion, but unfortunately also the brain. The gut to brain immunity links with the digestive tract. From your mouth all the way down to your digestive tract, it is in constant contact with both friendly and unfriendly microbes. Not surprisingly, at least up to 80% of your immune cells are found in your digestive tract. Wrapped around your small and large intestine is a layer of tissue crammed with immune cells called GALT, gut-associated lymphoidic tissue. The tissue is in close contact with the gut lining and your second brain, your enteric nervous system. It's poised to pounce on any dangerous microbe that make it into the intestines and multiply enough to be a threat. A key to good health is a diverse gut microbiome. It's the best way to keep bad bacteria from being a problem. The neutral and beneficial bacteria crowd the bad ones out so they can't usually get room to multiply. They usually can't get a foothold large enough to provoke your immune system into responding. When they do, your body generates an immune response to get rid of invaders. You become inflamed. Immune cells rush to the rescue and produce a wide range of chemical messengers called cytokines. The immune cell messengers are vital to coordinating and controlling the inflammation and the immune response. They tell more immune cells to join the battle, control fever, make you feel tired, give you that fatigue, so they slow you down, make your blood clot faster, and make you lose your appetite. When attacking the bacteria have been dealt with, different chemical messengers tell your body when to stop the acute stage of inflammation and begin to return to normal. Acute inflammation may, may make you feel lousy for a few days, but inflammatory response is typically only temporary. Your body usually handles acute inflammation effectively, turning it on and off quite smoothly. Sometimes acute inflammation doesn't resolve correctly. It lingers, causing ongoing low-grade symptoms. When inflammation is long-term, your immune system is stuck on high alert. Your production of inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1 and 6 continues and the cytokines and other proteins that should turn them off don't get produced in the right amounts. When you keep making inflammatory cytokines, they can also damage your brain, leading to brain fog, low mood, and irritability. Long-term inflammatory cytokines lay the groundwork for possible neurodegenerative disease and cognitive impairment. So, when the gut-brain connection is disrupted by inflammation, many of my treatment goals are to restore a healthy balance and bring the immune system back to normal. I will delineate multiple steps in the succeeding slides to enable this hopefully to happen and to share some clinical insights that you can have and implement Monday morning with your patient base. I always like to start all my webinars off with a quote. One of the most famous quotes that we've ever heard pertaining to the gut is very simply stated by Hippocrates, all disease begins in the gut. My objective is very simple. I want to share the science and there is a multitude of science speaking about the gut and the gut to brain axis in overall health and disease. And I want to take that science and enable everybody who's listening to bridge it to what I like to refer to as Monday morning application. What's the problem? Well, one of the major problems in America today is that the patients are unhealthy. So many of our patients walking in really haven't been taking care of themselves and are really on what we call a SAD standard American diet. That leads them down a path of inflammation and makes them more susceptible to overall poor health. One of the first things that we talk about when a patient sits down is sugar consumption. The average American consumes 160 pounds of sugar per year. That's 6.3 cups per week. That's 13 to 17 teaspoons per day. Sugar is a toxin. It works with the reward center in your brain 
and when mice were offered sugar, 94% of mice took sugar versus cocaine because of that reward center in your brain. Sugar is extremely deleterious. My recommendation is always to decrease sugar intake. In addition to that, wheat consumption. The average American consumes 146 pounds of wheat per year. Wheat, or if you will, gluten, the protein in gluten, but gluten means glue. Gluten is that protein that I just referred to. Glue, it damages gluten, your intestinal tract. So much so that it damages the villi or the microvilli, which are your shaggy carpeting that grab nutrients and bring them in. Gluten also, as you'll see in some succeeding slides, to virtually everybody has an inflammatory response. 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. Without question, we want to avoid anything that damages the integrity of the gut. Gluten is at the top of that list. In addition to that, surprisingly, so caloric sweeteners, the average American consumes 146 pounds of caloric sweeteners per year. All the stevia, the equals, um, the aspartame and the such, these caloric sweeteners increase the incidence of stroke and dementia in America anywhere between two and three times. They've also been shown to damage the microflora in most patients that consume them. There's been a direct rise in what we call diabetes. That is the parallel growth of diabetes and obesity. We call that diabetes. And that's really occurred since the 70s when America decided that fat was your foe and not your friend and carbohydrates were your friend. And now Americans are consuming a large amount of carbohydrates, mostly man-made carbohydrates. As Jacqueline once said, a very famous chiropractor, if man makes it, I won't eat it. I'd like to adhere to that statement. So now that we have this increase in carbohydrates, as soon as we started to increase carbohydrates and decrease our fat, we also increased our obesity numbers. So this direct growth together has been labeled diabetes. Joint pain, back pain, osteoarthritis. Eight out of 10 Americans have back pain. That is not an uncommon stat. Joint pain, back pain, osteoarthritis can be directly related to somebody's gut health. As you'll see in my Dr. Rob's matrix, you'll see that gut has a tremendous impact on joint, back, and osteoarthritis, leading you down a path of plausible osteoarthritis, and also autoimmunity. NSAIDs and medication. Non-steroid anti-inflammatories decrease pain, but they impair healing. Nutraceuticals decrease pain, but promote healing. Which do you want? NSAIDs decrease your ability to have muscle hypertrophy, joint cartilage synthesis, bones to recover, and they also lead you down a path of leaky gut and damaging the tight junctions. For my patients, since it's a non-prescription uh, substance, I can always recommend people not to consume NSAIDs. So NSAIDs are one of the biggest culprits in damaging our microflora. We live in a toxic world, toxin and stress. Without question, we would need to decrease our toxic load. And by 2050, 50% of Americans will probably have some form of symptomology towards a neurodegenerative disease. The gut has two key functions. Function number one, believe it or not, as we said, it's an immune function. 70 to 80 percent of your immune cells are in your gut. But something that's typically overlooked is food digestion for absorption of macro and micronutrients. Macronutrients are foods, micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. The gut is the body's second brain. The gut has its own nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. There's more cells in the enteric nervous system, nerve cells than any other nervous system in the body. So the first brain is the brain, the second brain is the gut, and the third brain is the liver. Here's a slide that I use in all my presentations, Dr. Rob's gut matrix. Let's take a good look at the gut. Most people don't realize, but the gut is made up of the small and the large intestine. Now the small intestine, as it's named, is truly a misnomer because it's really not small. It is 90% of the length. It's small in its diameter. 
its diameter of width is about an inch as compared to the large intestine, which is 2.5 inches. It's also small in its thickness. It's a single layer epithelial cell that has the thickness of a wet paper towel. The small intestine's purpose or function because of its lymph nodes is to absorb digested food particles, pass on vitamins, food particles, and water through its filter, its barrier into the bloodstream. The large intestine's basic premise is to also allow for some digestion, but also kill bacteria. The small intestine, when compromised, and we call that leaky or leaky gut. Now it can be compromised by a multitude of items, which we're gonna delineate in some of the succeeding slides. In that, when it's leaky, there can be damage to the gut lining. When it's leaky, there can also be damage to what we call the tight junctions. As you can see there, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is an endotoxin. Lipopolysaccharide is on the outside of the inside of the intestinal tract, holding what we call gram-negative bacteria there. When LPS is released into the bloodstream, Typically, you have that endotoxemia and will damage specific organ systems. In addition to that, one of the more common ways to get leaky gut is dysbiosis, an unleveling of good and bad bacteria. You need about 85% good bacteria not to have dysbiosis. In addition to that, yeast, fungus, viruses, bacteria, if we have leaky gut, will pass through the gut barrier once again. And when they do, as I stated in slide one, it can stimulate the immune system. Food sensitivities, they are very interesting in that food sensitivities can cause leaky gut or leaky gut can cause food sensitivities. 75% of the toxins that pass the gut get to the liver via the bloodstream. 25% go from the gut directly to via the portal vein to the liver. So it's not uncommon to see toxic and chemical overload leading to liver dysfunction. In addition, leaky gut can lead you down a path of blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, prediabetes and diabetes, and an increase in obesity. As I stated earlier, leaky gut leads you down a path of autoimmunity. It's very common to see thyroid problems when people have gut problems, leaky gut, leaky heart. The release of LPS increases the incidence of heart attack by three times. In addition to that, leaky gut leads you down a path of musculoskeletal system faults. Cytokines and MMPSs are released, leading you down a path of arthritis, joint pain, and soft tissue injury. And of course, without question, the gut to brain axis, bidirectional communication, leaky gut, leaky brain, gut on fire, brain on fire. With leaky gut, damaged cells in your intestines don't produce the enzymes needed for proper digestion. As a result, your body cannot absorb essential nutrients, which can lead to a hormone imbalance and a weakened immune system. LPS-induced mitochondrial DNA contributes to the NLRP3 release of the inflammasome. Interesting, LPS stimulates toll-like receptor 4, which stimulates IRF1, which stimulates the inflammatory pathway of the NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B ultimately will release interleukin-1 beta and ultimately also interleukin-18. In addition, through its second signal, it will also damage the mitochondria. So people will not only feel inflamed from the stimulation of the NLRP3 inflammasome pathway, they'll also feel fatigued. Here we have a really interesting slide where we're depicting things like stress, gut microbiota composition, toxic chemicals, specific medications, inflammatory cytokines, undigested food particles, lectins and agglutinins, fluid colorings and gums, which all lead you down a path of breakdown of mucosal lining and tight junctions, leading to permeable increase, ultimately leading to intestinal barrier dysfunction, which enables you to have food allergy and intolerances, immune system abnormalities, autoimmunity, and ultimately influence on the blood-brain barrier in neuroautoimmunity. Here we see a common food additive impacting gut bacteria. 
and that common food additive is an emulsifier. These emulsifiers actually drive intestinal inflammation. People overlook these additives in a lot of processed foods, and that is one of the biggest culprits leading us down a path of damaged gut lining health. Gut on fire means brain on fire. One of my most favorite statements, your gut on fire refers to the idea of you or a patient having gas and bloating. The reason that you get gas and bloating is there's no pain fibers in your gut and gas and bloating is the only way that your body has through symptomology to tell you that you're having a digestive problem. Because of that digestive problem, ultimately your brain will be on fire or if you will, you'll have brain fog. There's no pain receptors in your brain and the dull nerve response to your brain from your gut gives you a feeling of lethargy, i.e. brain fog. So when your gut's on fire, your brain's on fire. When your brain's on fire, your gut's on fire. This slide really exemplifies the idea of damage to the gut lining, leads you down a path of releasing LPS and amyloids. Most people don't realize that amyloids actually come from your gut ultimately leading to systemic inflammation, damaging the blood-brain barrier. Once inside the brain, once they pass the blood-brain barrier, doing specific inflammatory neural degeneration to the central nervous system compartments and also leading you down a path of amyloid placking. The gut-to-brain axis is implicated in many neurodegenerative diseases. Potential implication of toll-like receptor and gut to brain axis for people in Alzheimer's. In healthy subjects, the gut epithelial is guaranteed by tight junctions between the cells. Toll-like receptors are expressed on macrophages and dendritic cells and intestinal epithelial cells serving as a sentinel to monitor the pathogens in the gut. The vagus nerve appears to modulate communication between the gut and the brain. The whole microenvironment maintains in homostasis, during aging, the tight junction of intestinal and blood-brain barrier becomes permeable. Actually, in Alzheimer's patients, the diversity of the gut microbiota usually is decreased, while the population of pleuroinflammatory bacteria is increased. Bacteria and their excretion should cross the leaky gut and then activate the toll-like receptors in the epithelial cells and macrophages, leading to production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines make their way through the circulation or the vagus nerves to the brain, enlarge the neuroinflammatory responses, and promote neural degeneration in the central nervous system. This slide really depicts specific gut bacteria linked to an increase in lupus. What's most interesting about this slide, the takeaway here is the blood test also showed a rise in antibodies or immune proteins that bind to the bacterium during those times. There's a direct correlation between stroke and trigger intestinal abnormalities. Intestinal tissue appeared disorganized in the models that experienced a stroke on the right, but maintained an orderly appearance in healthy models on the left. Gut bacteria can influence depression, a great example of the gut to brain axis communicating. They analyzed in this study fecal, the microbiome data of over a thousand people. Specific bacteria were absent from the guts of people that had a diagnosis of depression. Exercises influence on the microbiome gut to brain axis. Aerobic exercise improves diversity and the abundance of the genre from the firmicutes, which may be the link between the positive effects of exercise on the gut and the brain axis. Let's now move on to the concept of the gut brain connection. Let's get to the root cause of a broken brain. In the gut to brain axis, there's 400 times the amount of messages from the gut to the brain than the brain to the rest of the body. There's over a thousand species in the gut, yet there's only three pounds of bacteria in the gut. However, there are trillions of bacterium in the gut. 20 million bacterial genes versus 2000 genes in humans. More bacteria than cells in the body. And believe it or not, the gut contains more neurotransmitters 
than the brain. As a matter of fact, it contains approximately 93% of the neurotransmitters. As we continue on with the gut to brain axis, the gut produces vitamins, digests foods, regulates hormones, excretes toxins, and produces healing compounds. So to treat the brain, you must first remove the cause of inflammation, such as leaky gut. This slide does a great job of expressing the gut to brain axis and inflammation between this bi-directional communication. Stress, infections, drugs, enzymes, dietary proteins, advanced glycated end products, antibodies, neurotransmitters, and antibacterial peptides all can lead to a stimulating inflammatory path from the gut to the brain. The huge takeaway here is a high percentage of abnormal intestinal permeability, i.e. leaky gut, were found among patients with autism and their relatives compared to normal subjects. Systems biological model of brain gut microbiome interactions. The gut microbiota communicates with the gut connectome, the network of interacting cell types in the gut that include neural, glial, endocrine, and immune cells via microbial metabolites. While changes in the gut function can modulate gut microbial behavior, the brain connectome, the multiple interconnected structural networks of the central nervous system, generates and regulates autonomic nervous system influences that can alter gut microbial composition and function indirectly by modulating the microbial environment in the gut. The gut microbiota can communicate to the brain indirectly via gut-derived molecules acting on afferent vagal and or spinal nerve endings or directly via micro-generated signals. Alterations in the gain of these bidirectional interactions in response to protuberations such as cycle social and or gut directed like diet medication and infection, stress can alter the stability and behavior of this system manifesting as brain gut disorders. The gut microglial connection implications for central nervous system diseases. Potential mechanisms by which intestinal microbiota regulate the maturation and functions of microglials. A. Short-chain fatty acids generated by the gut microbiota cross the blood-brain barrier via the circulatory system of the host and target the microglial to regulate their function or maturation. B. Immune cells expressing receptors that recognize short-chain fatty acids can migrate to the brain via the blood-brain barrier after signaling short-chain fatty acids that originate from the gut flora. C. The gut microbiota may communicate directly with brain-resident microglial via the vagus nerve. D. Before receptors recognizing short-chain fatty acids are expressed, other bacterial metabolites or microbe-associated molecular patterns, MAMPS, M-A-M-P-S, generated by the gut microbiota can cross the blood-brain barrier and target microglials to regulate their function or maturation. E. Peripheral macrophages that can recognize the relevant metabolites or MAMPs can migrate to the brain via the blood-brain barrier after receiving signals from bacterial metabolites or MAMPs released by the gut flora. This slide speaks to the idea that the gut microbiota can modulate the gut-brain axis through many pathways, including endocrine, immune, cytokines, and neural, vagus nerve, and enteric nervous system pathways. Gut dysbiosis leads to increased levels of inflammatory cells mediators. The modulation of systemic tryptophan levels is strongly implicated in relaying the influence of the gut microbiota to the brain. In addition, Short-chain fatty acids or neuroactive bacterial metabolites from dietary fibers possibly modulating the brain and the behavior of the individual. The microbiome releases LPS, amyloids, and exotoxins. The GI tract, you're seeing a specific idea of the LPS plus amyloid and other neurotoxins passing the GI tract barrier, leading to systemic inflammation because it's in the bloodstream. Ultimately, 
landing at the blood-brain barrier, a single-layer epithelial cell made up of the same protein as your gut. It's getting through your blood-brain barrier, stimulating central nervous inflammation by LPS stimulating and damaging neurons, ultimately leading with the addition of the amyloids to Alzheimer's disease and damage to those specific neurons. Here's another example of the gut to brain inflammation axis. Stress as medications, neurotransmitters, enzymes, neuropeptides, intestinal flora, or immune dysregulation generates immunomodulatory and inflammatory fragments of dietary proteins. Then in two, these fragments can diffuse into endothelial cells lining the GI tract. Three, interleukin-1, which is one of the product of fragment of dietary proteins, which bind to interleukin-1 receptor on the lateral border of the adjacent epithelial cell. Four, this interleukin-1, interleukin-1 receptor complex phosphorylates NF-kappa B. Five, activated NF-kappa B binds to DNA sequence in a nucleus of endothelial cell, inducing transcription of MLCK. That MLCK mRNA travels to the cytosol and is translated into MLCK proteins. Seven, these proteins bind to and open up the tight junction where dietary fragment proteins are released into the paracellular space. Eight, these particles are further released into the reticular tissue. Nine, APC recognizes the dietary fragment and presents to T cells. Ten. T cells generate killer T cells attacking epithelial cells that contain these inflammatory dietary fragments. 11. B cells are activated by T cells presenting the dietary fragment. In response, B cells generate antibodies against tight juncture proteins, IgG and IgM antibodies against diet peptides. This leads to cross-reaction in various tissues and induction of autoimmune disorders in different organs. Ultimately, in multitude of ways that I've showed you, the gut can lead to damage in the brain and can also lead to autoimmunity, especially at times autoimmunity against the gut lining itself. Here's another means in which the gut to brain axis has communication routes and physiological barriers. Obviously the two barriers are the gut lining and the blood brain barrier lining. The three routes are the immune system, the nervous system, and the vascular system. Autism risk is determined by mom's gut health. So the mom's microbiome determines risk of autism and other developmental disorders in offspring. The results raise the possibility autism could be prevented by altering expected mom's diet. The role of the gut microbiota in autism. The gut alters the immune system and metabolism. We see higher intestinal permeability with higher antigen load from the gastrointestinal region. LPS is increased in autism. The gut microbiome can be less diverse and candida can twice as abundant or typically twice as abundant in autism. Autism symptoms reduce 50% two years after fecal transplants. Interesting, the improvements in gut health and autism symptoms appear to persist long after the treatment. Two years post-treatment, a 58% decline in symptoms tied to GI problems, and the professional evaluator found a 45% reduction in core ASD, autistic spectrum disorder symptoms. Illuminating the gut-to-brain connection in autism. Up to 90% of people with autism suffered from gut problems. The gene mutation that affects neur neuron communication in the brain also causes dysfunction in the gut. Gut microbes are linked to brain structure. Um, research shows for the first time an association between the gut microbiota and brain regions involved in the processing of sensory information from their bodies. Chemicals in the gut can shape the human brain structure because these signals generated by the brain can influence composition of the microbes residing in the intestines. Once again, a great depiction of the gut to brain, brain to gut axis.
This particular study spoke to the idea of the association between the gut bacteria and your emotion. It actually had the idea of neurobiological differences associated with microbial composition in healthy humans. Chronic intestinal inflammation suppresses hippocampal neurogenesis. Increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines have detrimental effects on the proliferation of progenitors of neuronal lineage. Deficient hippocampal neurogenesis may underlie an increased rate of mood disorder and cognitive impairment observed in IBD patients. This study really interests me in that it really backed up what the small and large intestine were supposed to do because of the properties of their lymph nodes. The lymph nodes in the small intestine played a role of absorbing nutrients. As we had said earlier, the purpose of the small intestine is to absorb digested food particles, nutrients, and water, and the large intestine was there to kill bacteria as depicted by what the lymph nodes properties were in their respective regions. Very interesting when you look at this and you see the difference between a diseased central nervous system and a healthy central nervous system. Chiropractors base the bulk of their assessments on the structure and function of the central nervous system. One of the main contributors to a healthy versus diseased central nervous system is the health of one's gut, whether you have a healthy gut or a leaky gut. Leaky gut leads to a diseased central nervous system. Healthy gut leads to a healthy central nervous system. All health begins in the gut. Here's a great slide depicting the gut-brain axis, which may be the bridge between linking chronic pain with microbiome changes. For those who have fibromyalgia, a high incidence of them had fibromyalgia because they did not have diversity in gut bacteria, whereas those who did not have, or women without fibromyalgia, had more of a diversity of and of specific quantities of a good quality bacteria. Let's look at the principal mechanisms of the bidirectional brain gut microbiota axis. From the gut microbiome to the brain, there's production expression and turnover of neurotransmitters, serotonin and GABA, for example, and neurotrophic factors, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. There's a production of intestinal barrier and tight junction integrity, modulation of the enteric sensory afferents, bacterial metabolites, and mucosal immune regulation. From the brain to the gut microbiota, we have an alteration in mucus and biofilm production, alteration in motility, alteration of intestinal permeability, and ultimately alteration in immune function. A study done to show the intestinal and blood-brain barrier, the interface between health and diseases. The takeaway in this study was, we have the intestinal barrier and blood-brain barrier, two immune barrier systems that have the same purpose, to prevent invasion, infection, and disease. Bidirectional signaling between the brain and the gut has been confirmed by numerous studies. This communication between the gut and the brain is ongoing from birth and plays a significant role in shaping how the brain is wired. To recap the first half of the slides, intestinal permeability will lead to systemic bacterial toxins, which will lead to blood-brain barrier permeability, which leads to neuroautoimmune reactivity. Another interesting aspect of the microbiota is the importance of diversity. In fact, diversity appears to matter more than quantity. For example, studies in rugby players in Ireland found that increased diversity was associated with lower inflammation and healthier metabolic markers and that exercise increased this diversity. Conversely, decreased diversity has been associated with a number of health problems, including obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, insulin resistance, frailty in the elderly, and allergy in children. In addition to diversity of species, the species composition, i.e. the proportion of different species in a population, also influences health status. This is an area of active research, which at some point I hope to discuss in further detail. Here's a wonderful example of how gut bacteria can affect our metabolism. 
The mice receive gut bacteria transplants from overweight humans, gain more weight than the mice transplanted with gut bacteria from normal weight subjects, even when fed the same diet. The bottom line here is bacterial composition affects metabolism. Dysbiosis is associated with compromised gut function. So dysbiosis, we, we spoke about earlier, which was a unleveling of good and bad bacteria. Unfortunately, we need about 85% good to bad to not have dysbiosis. So uh, one of the things that's very surprising to my patient base is when I tell them how they have to populate their gut daily. Let's take a look at the next big thing. We've mentioned before, and let's speak about it a little bit more detail now, the basic anatomy and function of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve goes from the medulla oblongata down through to the transverse colon, attaching to the outside of the transverse colon. So it goes from the brain stem to the transverse colon, innervating all the different organs on its route to that transverse colon. It is 80 to 90% afferent, while only being 10 to 20% efferent. low vagal nerve tone has been seen in such conditions as irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel disease, thus actually increasing peripheral inflammation. Also, low vagal tone has been seen with a decrease in hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzymes, a reduced activity of parietal cells, and unfortunately, a reduced bile secretion. The takeaway here is Targeting vagus nerve through stimulation would be of interest to restore the homostasis in the microbiota gut-to-brain axis. Some of the influence of different bacterial species on vagus nerve and its systemic impact. Bifidobactam and lactobacillus acidophilus increase vagal nerve activity while decreasing LPS-induced inflammation and decreasing toll-like receptor 4 expression, leading to increased gut barrier function and decreased gut leakage, ultimately leading to increased cognitive reactivity to depressed mood and hypothalamus pituitary axis response, decreasing anxiety from irritable bowel syndrome in the brain. Bifidobactam longum has positive effects on chronic low-grade gut inflammation. It does so by having an effect on vagal tone integrity. Let's close with the idea of brain health. So ultimately our brain is not out of order. Exercise enhances hippocampal plasticity and hence improves cognitive performance. Physical activities promote the production and release of a variety of mediators in both central and peripheral nervous systems, such as neurotrophic factors, myokines, adiokines, and cytokines. These molecules enter the brain and regulate hippocampal plasticity by affecting neurogenesis, synaptic plasticity, and dendritic remodeling, eventually improving learning and memory performance. Let's take a look at the disturbances of the brain gut microbiota axis in Alzheimer's. The brain, which can have a leaky blood brain barrier, neural inflammation, neural degeneration, and amyloid beta formation can communicate with the gut in a bi directional manner. The gut through the enteric nervous system can have leaky gut, gut inflammation, and amyloid beta formation in the enteric neurons, which can get delivered to the brain. Now, the gut communicates with the microbiota. The microbiota can be under strain from dysbiosis, LPS production, and bacteria amyloid beta formation. So the microbiota gut to brain axis is like three-way calling. This slide shows leaky gut, damage to the tight junctions, and damage to the transcellular epithelial structure. If you can prevent 
this, you will be able to prevent mucosal immune abnormalities, imbalanced gut flora, intestinal barrier dysfunction, systemic inflammation, neuroinflammation, neuroinvasion, and ultimately neurodegeneration. Please keep an eye out for my upcoming book due quarter four, probably October, Super Highway to Health, The Seven Steps to Optimizing the Gut-Brain Connection. I always like to end with a quote. The one that comes to mind in reference to the material just discussed is, the mind once stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimensions, Sir Oliver Wendell Holmes.